I invite you, if you will, to share the call to worship with me as we read responsively. We thank you, O God, for your life pulsing in, revealed in Jesus, renewed in resurrection, available to us now. Thank you for touching us again with your life, for joining our lives with yours through Jesus, and for renewing resurrection in hearts through your Holy Spirit. We worship you, O Lord, and praise you, who has the power to overcome death with new life. In Christ, we now understand that all things are possible. Hope can never be extinguished and love cannot be overcome. With your word proclaimed in word and song, in the movement of your spirit within our beings, open us to believe that which we cannot explain, to hope for that which we cannot see, to love even in the midst of hardship, death, and despair. May our worship flow fresh with the strength of new life established in Christ, in whose words we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning and welcome to worship at River Road Church on this second Sunday in our Easter season. If you are a guest, we want you to know that you are especially welcome among us. And on the end of each pew, you will find a maroon binder. And in that, if you will place your name or any contact information, we just simply want to let you know how thankful we are that you were in worship with us today. Following worship today, there is a reception in our fellowship hall that everyone is invited to. And the fellowship hall can be found this, down this hallway, out this door to my left, or you can go out the back door and across the plaza and join us in the fellowship hall where we will share refreshments together and greet each other in Christ. Following that, there is a brief business meeting that will take place in the fellowship hall. And we invite you, if you would, to look through your bulletin and see the other things that are happening on the calendar this week so that you will find your place in service. I want to make note that um, we extend Christian sympathy to Joe Teefee and Judy Collins in the death of his brother, William Teefee Jr., who passed away on April 16th. You see that service information is still to come. trust that you will find your place of service and that we will join our hearts together as we continue in the worship of our Lord. Some of the most loving and giving individuals in our world are missionaries. In particular, I speak today about our CBF missionaries uh, whom we seek to support. Recently, on a Wednesday night, our pastor showed us a video of one of those missionaries in Haiti. Since 2008, Jenny Jenkins has been working in the most remote regions of Haiti. An interview with a local assured us that they felt they could not survive without this loving nurse missionary. 
You may have seen this uh, by way of our East Fire uh, that goes out from our church uh, because in recent weeks we've been putting these little two-minute uh, snippets about particular CBF missionaries uh, online with our East Fire. For the past 25 years, CBF uh, has been seeking to support missionaries around the world. Presently, we have them in 25 countries and in some of the most needy places in the USA. This could not happen without all of us, the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship Churches, giving support through our special mission offerings and through our budget. We at River Road, from the very beginning, have believed in missions. Uh, our histories of our church assure us of this. Uh, stories have been collected from the very beginning. And you know some of those important missions that are going out in our immediate com community, the southwest area of our state, regularly down to Panama, taking medical and dental and construction missions, particularly to help the indigenous tribes who are often forgotten. We could go on and on. You have perhaps participated in Rise Against Hunger with your family uh, as we have packed over 10,000 meals several times a year that go out to third world countries and needy people. I'm here today representing River Roads Board of Missions asking that we do all we can to continue to support the special offerings for missionaries. Without these special offerings, a vital part of their salaries would not be provided. We all need to work together, uh, as Baptists for so long have done, uh, in behalf of mission efforts. When I hear news of migrants fleeing violence and corruption from their native countries, I am saddened by their experience, but I'm also gratified to know, as I read of our CBF missions, that we have missionaries in many of those places that are receiving them, helping them to readjust uh, in their uh, unfortunate situations. A special mission that comes to mind because a missionary from that country came to visit us a couple of years ago is the mission of Uganda, where Missy Ward Angela works. Uganda is a unique opportunity for CBF missions right now and we have five missionaries there. Uganda is unique in that it's receiving freely many refugees from surrounding countries where there is such unrest that they need to get out. All over our world, in fact, there are marginalized people who need our help. I think of the Romani gypsies in Europe and we have a number of CBF missionaries there helping them to be aware of services uh, that uh, can give them important life support. Our missionaries, of course, are also supporting local pastors and churches wherever they are. Knowing about this work, as I continue to plug in to CBF online, uh, see the little snippets, that our church features compels me to feel that I must pray for these missionaries and give for their support. And so I hope that you will join me, listen to the stories uh, as you have opportunity and assist with their support. In the pew racks in our sanctuary are little envelopes uh, in which you can place a gift or your gifts can be received online.
Thank you. A reading from the Old Testament, Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his surpassing greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipes. Praise him with clanging cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The word of the Lord. from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name, the gospel of our Lord.
lift our voices with all creation, with Mary the God-bearer, and all the saints who have borne witness to the risen Christ. Let us offer ourselves and one another to the living God. resurrection and breathe upon us with your Holy Spirit. Patient God, you know us better than we want. We like, we like to think that we can fool you with our bravery and courage. We hear the story of doubting Thomas and think what a fool he was. We think we would never have doubted. And in our arrogance, we confidently walk around. But you know us fully. You know that we all have our moments of doubts and fears. We all wonder where you are. We want to know that everything is going to turn out for the best. We are frightened. And sometimes this feeling is overwhelming and stops us from moving forward. And in our fear, we cannot even face our own doubts. Help us to understand your forgiving grace. Help us to know that you understand our weaknesses and confusion and that your love extends to us in spite of that weakness. Strengthen our faith and our commitment to you. As we have offered prayers for those near and dear to us, as we have lifted situations of darkness and fear before you, help us to be people who truly believe that you hear our prayers and answer them. Where we have not seen, give us faith to believe in all you have said and done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. come to our time of giving as resurrection people. May all of our time, the gifts and talents that we possess, the resources and monetary offerings that we share, demonstrate our love and gratitude for God's work taking place in us and our hope for the Easter work that God will continue to do in our world.
I am really glad to see you here today. Many folks talk about today, they refer to this Sunday, the Sunday after Easter, as Low Sunday. <laughs> and frankly, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out why. Attendance is slightly less than last week. Our families who came in for Easter have probably gone back home. Sarah Pruden isn't racing down the center aisle shouting, He is risen. Not quite as many beautiful Easter hats among the congregation today. And my bet is the brass quintet is sleeping in. No, today stands in a bit of contrast to last Sunday, doesn't it? Therefore, it is tempting for us to say that Easter is over. But that would be wrong. For one thing, Easter is a season, 50 days leading up to Pentecost. But there is a greater reason as well. Easter isn't over because every time the resurrected Christ meets us here together, it is Easter again. I think this is the point the gospel writer John is trying to make in today's lesson. So let's look closer at the story. It begins on Easter evening. After experiencing the empty tomb and risen Christ that morning, Mary has been out preaching all over town that Jesus is alive. But where are the disciples? Are they out looking for the risen Christ? Are they out proclaiming the good news of the resurrection like the women are? No. The disciples, John tells us, are huddled together in the upper room of the house where they are staying. The same upper room, incidentally, where Jesus shared the Last Supper with them. Every knock at the door or sound downstairs on the street sends them into a panic. They are hiding out in fear. A while back, on an ABC News special entitled In the Name of God, Peter Jennings was interviewing the founder of Vineyard Christian Fellowship, a man named John Wimber. John said that the first time he went to church, he expected some rather dramatic things to happen. A friend had been telling him that he needed Jesus in his life. He told him of all the wonderful things that Jesus had done for him. So when John finally made it to church, he had pretty high hopes. But after attending church for three Sundays in a row, John became very frustrated. Following the service, he talked to a rather official-looking gentleman in the church, perhaps a deacon or staff minister, and asked him, when do you actually do it? Do what? the man asked. The, the stuff. What stuff? The stuff in the Bible. What do you mean? John said, you know, multiplying the loaves and fish, feeding the hungry, healing the sick, giving sight to the blind. That stuff, when do you do the stuff? Oh, the man replied somewhat apologetically. We, 
we don't really do that. We believe in it. We pray about it. But we don't actually do it. Yes, sometimes we're afraid. Not of our weakness, but of our power. We're afraid of the power we truly have to feed the sick, to feed the hungry, to heal the sick. We're afraid of the power we truly have if we would fully give ourselves to God. But sometimes it's easier just to draw the shades, to hide out inside, rearrange the furniture. I think John paints a picture of the disciples in this very state. Gathered together in the upper room, hiding out in fear. Not that I can blame them. I mean, they saw what happened to Jesus. They saw him brutally beaten, killed. They worry they could be next. In the midst of all of this, suddenly, in the blink of an eye, Jesus appears there with him. Scripture says the doors were locked, so I don't know how he got there among them. But Jesus says to them, Shalom Aleichem, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. Then Jesus breathes on them, and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. Do do you see why I say that John is trying to get us to see that Easter continues? This is what happens every time that we, Jesus' disciples, gather together. We can't explain it, but we know he's here. We can feel him around us. We see him in one another's faces. Jesus breathed his spirit upon us, and then he sends us out, empowered to do the stuff, empowered to do his work in the world. This is what I mean when I say John tells us Easter continues. But for one person, Easter didn't continue. For one person, Easter really didn't happen in the first place. The disciple Thomas was not there the day that Jesus appeared. Where was he? John doesn't tell us. Maybe it was his turn to get the coffee. I don't know, but he wasn't there. When he returns, the disciples excitedly say, Thomas, Thomas, we saw Jesus. We saw Jesus. But Thomas doesn't believe it. That's how Thomas got his nickname. You've heard it before, Doubting Thomas. We call him that because he wouldn't believe that Jesus had risen until he saw the scars in Jesus' hand and put his finger to Jesus' pierced side. So I suppose he's earned that nickname. But have you noticed, church, that whenever we call him Doubting Thomas, more often than not, we we do so in a somewhat chastising tone. We criticize Thomas for his doubt. In fact, when this text is preached, pastors often encourage their hearers not to be doubting Thomases, but to believe. I've heard some of those sermons. Perhaps you have too. But I think we ought to give Thomas a little more credit. I mean, he knew Jesus died, 
And now he's struggling to believe that Jesus is alive, and so he needs to see for himself. Wouldn't you feel the same way? At least Thomas feels safe enough or secure enough or honest enough to express his doubts. I find that refreshing. Friends, for too long, for too long it has been dangerous to talk about our doubts in church. We think somehow it's not Christian to have doubts about the faith. Well, it's not. It's not. Read this story again, and you'll see that Jesus does not chastise Thomas for his doubt. The way I see it, Jesus welcomes it. Because exactly one week after the resurrection, just like today, Jesus shows up again. This time, he goes straight to Thomas, but not to reprimand him. <coughs> Excuse me. He makes a beeline for Thomas and honors his doubt. He honors his doubt by showing Thomas his nail-scarred hands and his pierced side. <coughs> Excuse me. Thomas, Thomas, it's really me. Christ honors Thomas's doubt. Friends, we all have our experiences of doubt. To say otherwise, I think, is inauthentic. Frederick Beekner puts it this way, if you say you don't have any doubts about your faith, you're either kidding yourself or you're fast asleep. He says, and I love this, doubts are the ants in the pants of faith. They keep it awake and moving. What's more, the Bible says nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate us from God's love, not our doubts, not anything else. And church, I want you to hear me closely. We do not need to be ashamed when we doubt our faith. A couple weeks ago, at a Wednesday night educational program, Dr. Dan Bagby was teaching on forgiveness. We were in the third session in the series on forgiveness, and he had entitled this particular session, Forgiving God. We had talked about forgiving others, forgiving ourselves, and now forgiving God. It was an intriguing discussion. And in part of that discussion, we, we talked about how so often we, we are angry or upset at God, yet we feel so afraid to express that pain. And, and someone in the group, I, I don't remember who it was, said, I think we do the same thing about our doubts. Just like sometimes we think we can never get upset at God, we feel like we must not express our doubts about God and the faith, lest we seem somehow less Christian. And we talked about what it might mean for us as a church to encourage the expression of doubt. And, and as Dr. Bagby led this rich discussion, one of our other ministers, Reverend Daniel Ingram, said this, and I, I was so intrigued I wrote it down. He said, it seems to me that doubt is not at all, then, the opposite of faith. I think the opposite of faith is certainty. And it dawned on me, he's right. Doubt is not the opposite of faith. Certainty is. 
For if we have certainty about ourselves and about God and about everything, then what's the point of faith? Church, having doubt about this thing we call faith is not an indication of weakness, but rather of honesty. For doubt is a part of faith. In fact, I think doubt gives life to our faith. For one thing, our doubts give us a good dose of humility. Because no matter how smart we think we are, We do not have all the answers. So I want to give Thomas a little credit today. Because when he was filled with doubt and felt the pain of being left out, he said so. And even though he experienced this hurt, even though he experienced his doubts, he showed up the next Sunday. And Thomas was able to experience the risen Christ. And he had his questions answered because he stuck with it. And he showed up the next Sunday. Now before I close, let me mention one other side to this story. And I don't know that I had thought about it as much or seen it as clearly until I studied it this week. And that is the other disciples' response to Thomas' doubt. I I love this part of the story. When, When Thomas expressed his doubt, did the other disciples kick him out? Did they say, you must leave, you need to get out of here until you get your theology worked out, then you can come back? No. Best I can tell, they said, you don't believe this? That's okay. Come back next week. Because when Thomas comes back the next week, and when Jesus appears again to him, Where are the disciples? They are right there too. Literally surrounding Thomas with love. To me, authentic communities of faith will allow people, maybe even encourage people, to be honest and to express their doubts Authentically. One of my favorite writers, Anne Lamott, describes her own church this way. She says, When I was at the end of my rope, the good people at St. Andrew tied a knot in it for me, and they helped me to hang on. As a church, it is not our job to tell people not to have doubts, or to kick them out until they get it all resolved, then they can come back. Our job, I believe, is to help them give voice to their pain and express their doubt and help them to hang in there in the midst of all of it. We, as River Road Church family, should encourage the honest expression of doubt. We should encourage people's questions about faith because you know what? God can take it. And we can too. And here's the truth. We are called together for a purpose. You're a part of this family for a reason. We are called together to be church to love one another, to listen to one another, to help one another hang in there. That means today is still Easter. Next week will still be Easter. Every Sunday here at River Road Church is Easter because all along our journey, and that includes moments of clarity and moments of doubt, all along our journey, 
Every time we gather, the resurrected Christ meets us here. And for that we say, thanks be to God. you join me as we read our benediction together. Filled with life, we now offer ourselves to be life bringers in this world. Touched by resurrection, we pledge to resist death wherever we find it. Filled with hope, we embrace the promise of eternity and the call to make it known at every opportunity. <laughs>